of Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford. After they had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, they were encountered many times with cross winds and met with many fierce storms with which the ship was sh shroudly shaken and her upper works made very leaky. And one of the main beams of the midships was bowed and cracked, which put them in some fear that the ship could not be able to perform the voyage. So some of the chief of the company, perceiving the mariners to fear the sufficiency of the ship as appeared by their mutterings, they entertained, I'm sorry, they entered into serious consultation with the master and other officers of the ship to consider in time of the danger and rather to return than to cast themselves into a desperate and inevitable peril. And truly there was great distraction and difference of opinion amongst the mariners themselves. Fain would they be to do what could be done for their wages' sake being now near half the seas over, and on the other hand, they were loath to hazard their lives too desperately. But in examining of all opinions, the master and others affirmed they knew the ship to be strong and firm under water, and for the buckling of the main beam there was a great iron screw the passengers brought out of Holland, which would raise the beam into his place, the which being done, the carpenter and the master affirmed that with a post put under it, set firm in the lower deck and other ways bound, he would make it sufficient. And as for the decks and upper works, they would caulk them as well as they could, and, the, and though with the working of the ship they would not long keep staunch, yet there would otherwise be no great danger if they did not overpress her with sails. So they committed themselves to the will of God and resolved to proceed. In sundry of these storms, the winds were so fierce and the seas so high as they could not bear a knot of sail, but were forced to hull for diverse days together. And in one of them, as they thus lay at hull in a mighty storm, a lusty young man called John Howland, coming upon some occasion above the gratings was with a seal of the ship thrown into the sea, but it pleased God that he caught hold of the topsail halyards, which hung overboard and ran out at length. Yet he held his hold, though he was sundry fathoms under water, till he was hauled up by the same rope to the brim of the water, and then with a boat hook and other means got into the ship again and his life saved. And though he was something ill with it, yet he lived many years after and became a profitable member both in the church and the commonwealth. In all this voyage there died but one of the passengers, which was William Button, a youth, servant to Samuel Fuller, when they drew near the coast. But to, admit, uh, but to omit other things, that I may be brief, after a long beating at sea they fell with that land, which is called Cape Cod, the which being made and certainly known to be it, they were not a little joyful. After some deliberation had amongst themselves, and with the master of the ship, they tacked about and resolved to stand for the southward, the wind and weather being fair, to find some place about Hudson's River for their habitation. But after they had sailed that course about half the day, they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers, and they were so far entangled therewith as they conceived themselves in great danger, and the wind shrinking upon them withal, they resolved to bear up again for the cape, and thought themselves happy to get out of those dangers before night overtook them, as by God's good providence they did. And the next day they got into the Cape Harbor, where they rid in safety. Being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. The Starving Time But that which was most sad and lamentable was that in two or three months' time half their company died, especially in January and February, being the depth of winter, and wanting houses and other comforts, being infected with the scurvy and other diseases which this long voyage and their inaccommodate condition had brought upon them. So as there died sometimes two or three a day in the foresaid time, that of one hundred and odd persons, scarce fifty remained. And of these, in the time of the most distress, there was but six or seven sound persons who, to their great commendations, be it spoken, spared no pains night or day, but with abundance of toil and hazard of their own health, fetched them wood and made them fires, dressed them meat, made their beds, washed their clothes, their loathsome clothes, clothed and unclothed them, in a word, did all the homely and necessary offices for them which dainty and queasy stomachs cannot endure to hear named, 
and all this willingly and cheerfully, without any grudging in the least, showing the, herein their true love unto their friends and bre brethren, a rare example and worthy to be remembered. Two of these seven were Mr. William Brewster, their reverend elder, and Miles Standish, their captain and military commander, unto whom myself and many others were much beholden in our low and sick condition. And yet the Lord so upheld these persons as in the general calamity they were not at all infected either with sickness or lameness. And what I have said of these I may say of many others who died in this general visitation, and others yet living, that whilst they had health, yea, or any strength continuing, they were not wanting to any that had need of them. And I doubt not, but their recompense is with the Lord. But I may not here pass by another remarkable passage not to be forgotten. As this calamity fell among the passengers that were to be left here to plant, and were hasted, hasted ashore, and made to drink water that the seamen might have and have the more beer, and one, in his sickness desiring but a small can of beer, it was answered that if he were their own father he should have none. The disease began to fall amongst them also, so as almost half their company died before they went away. And many of their officers and lustiest men, as the boatswain, gunner, three quartermasters, the cook, and others, at which the master was something strucken and sent to the sick ashore and told the governor he should send for beer for them that had need of it, though he drunk water homeward bound. But now amongst his company there was a far another kind of carriage, in this misery than amongst the passengers. For they that had been boon companions in the drinking and jollity in the time of their health and welfare began now to desert one another in this calamity, saying they would not hazard their lives for them, they should be infected by coming to help them in their cabins, and so, after they came to lie by it, would do little or nothing for them, but if they died, let them die." But such of the passengers as were yet aboard showed them what mercy they could, which made some of their hearts relent, as the boatswain and many others who was a proud young man and would often curse and scoff at the passengers. But when he grew weak, they had compassion on him and helped him. Then he confessed he did not deserve it at their hands. He had abused them in word and deed. Oh, saith he, you, I now see, show your love like Christians indeed to one another, but we let one another lie and die like dogs." Another lay cursing his wife, saying if it had not been for her, he had never come to this unlucky voyage, and anon cursing his fellows, saying he had done this and that for some of them. He had spent so much and so much amongst them, and they were now weary of him and did not help him, having need. Another gave his companion all he had, if he died, to help him in his weakness. He went and got a little spice and made him a mess of meat once or twice, and because he died not so soon as he expected, he went amongst his fellows and swore the rogue would cousin him. He would, not, he would see him choked before he made him any more meat, and yet the poor fellow died before morning. Indian Relations All this while the Indians came skulking about them, and would sometimes show themselves aloof off. But when any approached near them, they would run away, and once they stole away their tools where they had been at work and were gone to dinner. But about the 16th of March, a certain Indian came boldly amongst them and spoke to them in broken English, which they could well understand, but marveled at it. At length they understood by discourse with him that he was not of these parts, but belonged to the eastern parts where some English ships came to fish, and with whom he was acquainted and could name sundry of them by their names, amongst whom he had got his language. He became profitable to them in acquainting them with many things concerning the state of the country in the east parts where he lived which was afterwards profitable unto them, as also of the people here of their names, number, and strength of their situation and distance from this place, and who was chief amongst them. His name was Samoset. He told them also of another Indian whose name was Squanto, a native of this place, who had been in England and could speak English better than himself. Being, after some time of entertainment and gifts dismissed, a while after he came again, and five more with him, and they brought again, tool, again all the tools that were stolen away before, and made way for the coming of their great sachem, called Massasoit, who about four or five days later came with the chief of his friends and other attendants, with the aforesaid Squanto, with whom, after friendly entertainment and some gifts given him, they made a peace with him, which hath now continued this twenty-four years, in these terms. Number one, 
that neither he nor any of his should injure or do hurt to any of their people. Number two, if any of his did hurt to any of theirs, he should send the offender that they might punish him. That if anything were taken away from any of theirs, he should cause it to be restored, and they should do like to his. Four, if any did unjustly war against him, they would aid him. If any did war against them, he should aid them. Number five, he should send to his neighbors confederates to certify them of this, but they might not wrong them, but might be likewise comprised in the conditions of peace. Number six, that when their men came to them, they should leave their bows and arrows behind them. After these things, he returned to his place called Soams, some 40 miles from this place. But Squanto continued with them and was their interpreter and was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. He directed them how to set their corn, where to take fish, and to procure other commodities, and was also their pilot to bring them to unknown places for their profit, and never left them till he died.